So hello everyone and you're all very welcome to Chester Beatty's Steampunk Mask Workshop for Teens with Megan Spock, Megan Scott, Megan Spot, <laughs> Megan Scott. And this is in conjunction with Dublin Maker as part of Science Week. So Dublin Maker is also streaming this workshop through their YouTube channel. So hello to everyone joining us on YouTube. My name is Heidi and myself and my colleague Justina will be in the background helping out. So if you have any problems or issues during the workshop, please pop that into the Q&A if you're on Zoom or if you're on YouTube, pop that into the chat and we'll be able to let Megan know if you need her to repeat anything or to slow down. We will also have a dedicated Q&A session at the end of this workshop. So if you are watching on Zoom and you'd like to pop any questions for us, please put them into the Q&A. Or if you're watching via YouTube with Dublin Maker, please pop those into the chat and Vicky from Dublin Maker will be able to get those through to us and we can get through as many of those as we can before the end. So before we start, I'd like to introduce you to Vicky from Dublin Maker. Vicky. Oh, thank you. Um, so uh, I'm Vicky from Dublin Maker. And uh, for those who don't know uh, who Dublin Maker or what the Dublin Maker is, we run an annual Maker Festival here in Dublin, um, except for this year um, because of COVID. And uh, so we we've moved it to next summer, but we missed all our makers so much. So we decided to invite all the local makers around Ireland to come and uh, share their workshops and projects and um basically get everyone involved and joining in the workshops. So today we're just really delighted to be partnering up with Chester Beatty and with Megan uh, with this wonderful workshop. I saw, I kind of, I can see in the background, those masks look amazing. So I'm looking forward to see, you know, how people get on and see how you make it because I want to make one as well afterwards. So, um, so I'll probably just, uh, uh, so yeah, if you have any, as, as Heidi said, any questions, just post it onto the live chat if you're on YouTube. Um, so I will leave. Uh, the workshop to you um, again. Okay. Okay, great. Um, so I'll just show you the uh, one of the finished masks I've made that I've colored first, so you can see kind of roughly what we're going to be making. Um, so see it here. It is a steampunk inspired uh, Plague Doctor mask, uh, and I'll show you how it has a moving steampunk inspired piece. Um, so I made this out of regular printer paper and I used some wax crayons and paint to colour it in. Um, I find wax crayons are handy because it adds an extra bit of sturdiness to the piece. But we're just going to be making the regular white one today um, and then you can colour it in at your leisure. So it should look something like this when we're finished. Leave that in the background. So oh, um, I'm also going to be angling down my camera um, so you can see what I'm doing on my desk. Um, something I would suggest is maybe having a few sheets of paper or I have a scratch board, um, something so you don't damage the table when you're doing poking holes in the paper. So or if you have a piece of cardboard or something to lay down. Um, okay. So the first thing you're going to want to do is take a sheet of your paper and I'm just going to make a regular half fold from right to left so that you have the fold on your right hand side and then fold the paper in half. So, then you're going to take a pencil. I'm going to take a pen because you're not going to be able to see it if I use a pencil, but you can use a pencil. And we're just going to be drawing a curve. This is going to be the beak. So you want a kind of a bulging curve all along here that we're going to cut out. So start on the left hand side and just draw a curve all the way to the fold. So it should look something like this. It can be, it can be a little bit less or a little bit more curvy depending on how curved you want your beak to be. Um, and then you're gonna take your scissors and just cut along the curve that you've made. Now, this is going to be your beak. So you can take that to the side for a moment and you're gonna take your excess piece of paper, this piece here. Um, always good to use excess paper, um, waste not, whatnot. 
and you're going to take your toilet roll holder and draw a circle in the excess paper. Again, I'm going to do it in pen, but you can do it in pencil um, so that you can see. I found that the uh, circumference of the toilet roll tube is pretty good for the size that you want for this circle. So um, that was a happy coincidence. It means you don't have to use any um, any extra tools. So you should have a circle roughly like that. And I'm gonna put a dot in the center of the circle. And this is going to be your cog piece. So what you're gonna to wanna to do is draw some little teeth to make up the cog on the outside. Now it's not gonna be a real cog, as in it's not going to be working with other cogs. So it doesn't have to be perfect. It's more just the aesthetic. Um, the steampunk genre often uses cogs and watches as part of, of the whole aesthetics of the genre. Um, along with metal colors, brown colors, um, lots of really cool fashion, as well as some lace usually as well. So you should be left with something that looks something like this. Now the next bit is a little intricate, so hopefully you'll be able to see it okay. But basically we're just going to be drawing some lines going from the center dot, not touching the center dot, but just from the center to almost the outside. I'll draw one and then I'll show you what I mean. So a line like this. And then we're gonna draw a curved line. So you're kind of making a seven. Backwards seven, an L maybe? Yeah, kind of like an L. And you're gonna do this all the way around the circle of roughly the same size. You're gonna draw a bunch of L's. So they shouldn't touch each other, but they can be they can be close. Maybe not too close. I'll show you roughly what I'm doing again up close. Kind of like that. So you should be left with something that looks a bit like that. With lots of little L's or little sevens going around. So the next thing you want to do is you want to cut out this piece. Um, you cut out maybe the circle first and then start cutting all the little cogs with the smaller scissors. It might be a bit easier. Um, Then you're going to take your small scissors and just cut out all the little little cog bits. If you're making this again to uh, make a colored in version, I'd probably color it in now and then cut later. But for now, I'm just going to make a white version so that you guys can see it really clearly. Um, and it's always good to make a practice one. But also to look up different examples of the steampunk aesthetic because there's lots of different ways you can do it. Um, kind of based on the Victorian era. So there's often like some lace and cloth, but mixed in with them um, steam powered technology. You should be kind of getting something roughly like this. Again, if this were a real cog, it would need to be perfectly exact, but it's just the uh, it's just the aesthetic of a cog, so don't worry if they're not perfectly straight and all exactly the same size. So 
So when you kind of cut out your cog, you should have a shape like this. And the next thing you're gonna to wanna to do is poke a little hole right in the center dot. So I'm gonna use the tip of my nail scissors, gonna press down on the hole. I'm not gonna use too much pressure. I'm just gonna use like a circular motion, kind of like that. And that should make a hole um, in the paper very easily there. Now you're gonna to wanna to take one of your toothpicks and push it through the hole. This is gonna widen the hole a little bit. You kind of want the hole to be, you don't want it to be too snug because you want it to be uh, able to rotate really easily. So kind of just move it around in the hole a little bit, make sure it's got plenty of room. And um, yeah, make sure it can spin okay. Now, the next thing we're gonna make are the little flaps of paper that catch the breeze, um, kind of like a pinwheel. So to do this, you're going to have to cut into the center of the paper. And the best way to do that is to make a little fold or one of the lines kind of like this so that you can cut into it with your nail scissors. It's quite small work and it's a little bit hard to see, but we're trying to basically cut along the seven lines, the, uh, the, the L-shaped lines that we have. Um, nail scissors are really handy for this because they tend to be slightly curved. So um, it'll help you cut along the curve a little bit. Um, I will show you maybe a finished one if it's not totally clear what I'm doing right now. Um, I'll, cut, I'll cut one out and then I'll show you a finished one. Um, so the cut, the cut should look something like this. And you kind of fold it down. So you should have a little flap kind of like that that's going to catch the breeze. So the finished one would look like this and it's got lots of little flaps. Um, hopefully that's clear enough. I'm going to keep cutting around all of my little L shapes now. So again we're cutting into the center of the paper so folding it to get an edge that you can cut with a scissors is handy. Careful of your fingers. I've started off with the most uh, difficult bit. The second part is uh, a lot easier. So if you get through this, you're, uh, you're flying. So what we're making here is a little pinwheel kind of, um, a little wheel, a little cog with flaps that are going to catch the, bre the breath from your, the air from your breath and spin the wheel. The idea for this was obviously inspired by the fact that a lot of uh, steampunk aesthetic and um, that whole genre is very much inspired by steam. Um, so I took it in a bit of a different direction with air. <laughs> so when you're finished, you should have all your little cuts and you're gonna fold down the little, the little flaps so that they're kind of in this shape here, if that makes sense. kind of folding them down so that they're perpendicular to the paper. And it's going to start to look a bit more like a wheel or like a cog. And when you're finished, you should have something, roughly something that looks a bit like this. And this is how it looks from this side. Oh, it's really hard to get the right angle. 
from this side. Okay. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to take our beak that we cut out earlier. The shape should look something like this if it's flattened out. And we're going to decide where we're going to put our, uh, our spinning pinwheel on our beak. So when the beak is finished, these loose sides are going to be stapled together. So it's going to look a bit like this. And um, this side is going to be flattened. So really, we're going to want to put it somewhere up on the top of this curve, somewhere kind of here. So I think it will go roughly somewhere like there on your on your on your beak. A little bit higher than it looks like it should go, but this side is going to be kind of flattened out on the bottom of the beak. So this is actually a pretty good. And then maybe a bit closer, maybe like there. So in the kind of in the the left on the top. Then you're gonna take, I'm gonna take a pen, but you can take a pencil and we're gonna just put it inside the hole that we've created. So we uh, have a little dot so we know where our pinwheel is gonna go. Like that. Now we're gonna take a straw. And we're gonna find out where we're gonna position our straw. So if this is the top of our beak here, our mouse is going to be somewhere here. So we're probably going to have it near the bottom. And we're not going to have it going into the center of uh, the pinwheel. We want it to catch the, um, catch the little kind of flaps that we have. So we're going to have it on the, on the side to, so that the air catches the flaps. And um, so maybe there, I think. Or you could do it on the other side. I think if you followed along exactly like I have, maybe do it on the left side so that the beak is facing this way. And then the flaps should catch slightly better. So I'm gonna draw my dot in here. And I'm going to make a little mark where I'm going to cut a hole for my straw. So it should be roughly there. And um, you can place your straw on top so you can draw a little circle that we're going to cut out in a minute, like so. And now, like we did before, you're cutting into the center of a piece of paper, so you have to make an edge so you can cut. We're going to cut out the circle as best we can. With the paper like so, try to place your straw through the hole, just a little bit out, just enough so that it's secure like that. Flip it over and stick it down to your paper. So I'm going to take a little bit of sellotape, could use glue. But I find that this is probably the best you sell it tape down onto your mask. You can flip it over again and you should have your straw connected to your to your beak. And then next you're gonna wanna add the pinwheel. So this is a fairly difficult part of it. It gets a lot easier after you're finished with the pinwheel, don't worry. Um, but you're going to use a cocktail stick. I'm going to cut off the edges. You're only going to need about three fingers worth, so I'm going to cut off like these two edges here. Also, we don't need it to be sharp, so we don't need the sharp edges. Um, just be kind of slow and careful when cutting these off. Uh, don't use too much pressure, it'll go flying. <laughs> Um, oh, you want to make a hole, sorry, in your paper first. So maybe just like you did before to make a little hole. Just poke a hole with the scissors, going around a few times, doesn't need much pressure. 
um, make the hole a little bit bigger by putting your toothpick inside of it. Shouldn't be snug, so again, move it around a little bit, make sure it has plenty of room. Yeah, that's good. Um, now you're almost ready to start putting everything together. Get a very tiny bit of your blue tack and warm it up in your hands. When I say very tiny, I do mean like a very, very, very tiny, tiny little bit. You don't need much for this. Um, you're gonna place it on one end of your toothpick. So this stops the wheel going flying everywhere. Um, like so. Now we're gonna place the wheel, or yeah, we'll put the toothpick down onto the wheel so you have it in the right position and pull it through. So it should look something like this. And the second part to keep the, uh, the wheel in the correct position is you're gonna to need to get, you can put that upside down there for a second, another little bit. We're using three tiny bits of blue tack to keep this spinning in the right way. Oops. So very, very tiny, just a tiny bit like this. Warm it up in your hands first so that it's nice and sticky. And then I usually roll it into a very, very tiny um, cylinder kind of shape. And you want to place it just below where the flaps would be. So like around about there. Cause you want to keep it this far away from the mask so it doesn't, you know, flatten down onto the mask. So I'm going to place a little bit of blue tack just here. That should keep our pinwheel roughly in the right place. Now we can put the pinwheel into the hole that we've made for it, like so. You gotta be fairly delicate with this process. Um, it's paper after all we're using, so. Um, and now our last tiny bit of blue tack warming up in our hands, pulling apart, making it nice and sticky, rolling it into a tiny cylinder. And so that our pinwheel doesn't go flying, we're gonna make a final little clamp to keep it steady. I don't know how well you guys can see that. I hope you can see it okay. I'll show you when it's when it's on as well. Um, hopefully your hands aren't as shaky as mine. <laughs> so it should be on and look something like this on the other side of the mask. Um, so then you pull the two sides together gently. And this is going to be your beak, like so. And you're gonna to wanna to staple along the curve. You could also sellotape or glue, but I quite like the staples because it kind of fits in with the aesthetic of the steampunk and the kind of metal aesthetic. Could even be made into your finished design. It's broken. Oh dear. <laughs> oh, okay. My stapler has run out of staples. Yep. Oh well. Um, I guess maybe I'll finish it off with a bit of cell tape, which is the same. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. It's always something. Um. I mean. This is steampunk inspired. Punk generally means, you know, a little bit haphazard, a little bit like put together, uh, not super professional, kind of the opposite of that. So, <laughs> my excuse. <laughs> so if you're stapling, try to staple as many as you can. Like don't just do a few staples, do plenty of staples to keep it all together. Um, even staples like right next to each other, that's fine. 
you'll be left with something that's like roughly like that at the top. Flatten out the bottom part. Just put your hand in. And sort of starting to guide the paper into the shape you want your beak to be. So I usually squeeze these areas here a little bit. Just like put my thumb. And doing this shape, shape it into the sort of beak like shape. So you should be left with something that looks a little bit into this shape here. I don't know if you guys can see that very well, but it is kind of a beak shape now. And more, it can be more curved if you want it to be. More like this. And then you have your beak and your pinwheel ready to go. You can also chop off a little bit of this, maybe just this. You only need about this much to get it into your mouth. I'm going to chop off a little bit. Yeah, you can move on to the top part of the mask. Take your, put your beak to the side for now. We're going to attach that later and we're going to make um, the kind of eye piece of the mask. So again, we're going to fold it in half, having the fold on the right hand side. And you're going to take your pencil. I'm going to take a pen again so you can see it. And we're going to draw a sort of section of a heart sort of shape. So it's going to look something like, I'm going to start on the bottom, move up to the side. So it kind of looks like a section of a heart. Love heart. You can see that okay. Um, and then next we're going to draw a line going from this angle here or this this point here um, to a couple, about two inches um, from the bottom right hand corner. So you should be left with something that looks roughly like this. You can do this in pencil if you need to get it. You can do it a few times, but it should look something like this. And we're gonna cut out this shape. So take your scissors again and cut along the lines. Should be left with a shape that looks something like this. We'll keep it folded for now though, because we're going to take our toilet roll tube again and we're going to place it fairly near the um, fairly near the fold and about halfway down. And I find that that is probably the best for the eye holes. I mean, it depends on the shape of your own face, but. The eye holes are pretty big, so it should fit everybody. You should be able to see. So you're drawing around your toilet roll tube to get your eye shape, and you're gonna to wanna to cut this out. And we can cut both, eye, both eyes out at the same time. We're gonna fold our paper, because we're cutting into the center of paper again. So to get our edge for our scissors, we're gonna fold the paper. And just make a small cut, an incision, so that you now have somewhere that you can put your scissors into to cut out the rest of the hole. You don't want this to be too snug either. You want to make sure the toilet roll fits through. Um, so just cut maybe slightly outside the lines even. And then once you have the hole cut out, test it with your toilet paper tube to see if it's big enough or if you need to cut it again. Mine's okay, it fits through fairly nicely. Um, and then you have your mask shape cut out like so. Um, one final thing for this is to cut just like a one centimeter line here, I got it in pen so you know what I'm cutting. Just putting a slight, slight incision in here. 
reason I'm doing that is because when I'm going to attach it to the other bit of the mask, I'm going to use these two flaps that are then created. So I can create a little crease here and here. So these are going to be the little flaps that I'm going to then stick down onto the mask. Um, and now it's time to make our goggles, which are really fun. So the toilet oil tube comes out again. Um, we're going to cut it into thirds. So again, it doesn't have to be exact. I don't like to measure things unless I really have to, and you definitely don't have to for this, but you want roughly a third. So something like maybe this. Yeah. You wanna cut your toilet roll tube into three parts. So again, we're gonna fold it again, make an incision, and then Put in a straight line as much as possible. And then you have something that looks like this. And I'm gonna do that again. Flatten the toilet tube to cut. Oh, you should be left with. I'm gonna use these two pieces now next. So um, take one of your thirds, and you want to draw a line roughly in the center. You're gonna to want to draw this line all along. So moving the toilet roll tube around to draw the line. That's going to be the center point show you this now when I'm finished, if you can't see what I'm doing exactly. I'm just drawing a line around the center. And I'm going to draw what I'm gonna cut so that you can definitely see it before I do it, but you don't have to draw this. So the lines I'm gonna be cutting into the toilet roll tube are gonna go right up to the center line that I've drawn. And they're going to look something like this. Those are the lines I'm going to cut. And um, I'm gonna do that all along one side. And on the other side, I'm also going to cut lines, but they're going to be sort of, they're going to be staggered so that I don't accidentally cut the whole thing in half. So the other lines I'm going to cut are going to go like this. So hopefully that makes sense. The center line doesn't, doesn't really get, doesn't get cut. It's these lines that are getting cut. Um, and then you should be left with, well, I'll show you, hopefully it's clear enough. Um, Going along all of one side first, and then I'm going to do the other side. If for your colored type, you decide to uh, paint the toilet roll tube or spray paint it or anything like that, um, or color it in, it's actually going to be the inside that's going to be uh, on show. So you'd have to be coloring the inside of it. So just to let you know. And beforehand. So I have one side all done, should look a bit like this. And I'm gonna start cutting the other side. So, so that we don't cut into it, we're gonna be cutting down to the center of the other flap. You want to cut it right up to that line because we're going to be folding it so you don't want to have a lot of space. Um, so those are all of my cuts. And I'll show you now how it goes into the mask before I do the second one. You take your mask and you place the toilet roll tube through so that's halfway through. So that line is roughly where the mask is, like so. And then you take, switching both sides, so you have your thumb on the top, maybe like this, side, yeah, sideways is better. You have your thumb on the top and your fingers on the bottom. You start folding down each, each side. And doing it at the same time at the bottom and the top helps it not go all crazy. Um, 
I'm just kind of gently folding it down at the beginning so that it's a bit like this. And then when you have the, when you have it sort of, you know, when you've introduced the paper to uh, the cardboard to the way you want it to be, you can then um, place it over and you can push it down more with more force so that you get it really flat. So it should look a bit like this. And on the other side, it looks like this. And you can either glue or sellotape this bit down. I'm gonna sellotape because it's a bit faster. Um, make sure to have Probably very loud. Sorry. <laughs> uh, make sure to have all of the uh, all of the edges glued or sellotaped down, because otherwise they can kind of annoy your eyes. So uh, don't skimp on this bit. Here, you have one goggle done. We're going to do the exact same thing for the other side. Oh, sorry. You probably hear the dog in the background. So in case you missed what I was doing, I'll do it all over again for the other goggle. So drawing a line down the center. Like so. And then cutting little flaps in. They're, if you need to know size, I mean, they're roughly half a centimeter, maybe a centimeter. You don't want them to be too big, because then it makes it harder to fold. So kind of kind of small little flaps. Um, I don't know how much everybody knows about plate doctors, but um, they kind of came about in the uh, 17th century. And um, their mask and their getup was kind of inspired by birds because a lot of the birds were sort of symbols of death and they'd, uh, they'd be quite a scary looking doctor to come around to you, the plague doctors. And they had the big beaks so that they could fill fill the beaks with um, sweet smelling stuff like flowers and spices um, because they used to believe that uh, that would ward off any illness. Okay, I think I'm done now with that one. So I've got my flaps all done again, like so. And I'm gonna place it into the mask. So it's in halfway, like so, and I'm going to use my fingers and thumbs to flatten down the top and the bottom roughly at the same time, I find is the best way. So it kind of grabs the paper. This is why it doesn't matter if the hole is a bit bigger because it's definitely not going to go anywhere. Um, Once you've got it kind of flattened out roughly the way you want it, you can turn it over and really put more pressure on the folds. And then you just need to stick it down again. Make sure to stick it down on the same place, on the same side that you stuck it down before. And you should be left with something that looks roughly like this. And then you can paint that if you wanted to. Um, at this point, I would also probably uh, do any designs I wanted to do along the edges or paint it or color it or stick on lace or something. 
um, because afterwards we're going to be adding more sellotape. So you'd want to do that before you do any more sellotape. Um, sellotape doesn't like to be drawn onto. Um, the next part, what are we doing for time? Okay, yeah, I'm almost finished. So um, just going to show you quickly how I would attach string. I would do two little dots on either side. And one little dot here, and I'd poke my holes in the same similar way that we've done a few times before. So this is going to be where I'm going to add the string so I can attach it to my face. And I might use a cocktail stick uh, to make them a bit wider because my string is very wide. Um, Um, so a handy way of measuring your how much string you're going to need is, I'll show you now by moving my camera back up to me, hello, um, I usually put it around my head and bring it to my eyes and that will tell me how much string I need plus the bit of extra for uh, tying knots, so it will be there, so that I know how much I need. So this is for the string that goes around the head and for the string that goes around the top of the head. I do the same thing and I bring it roughly down. So I know I have enough that I can tie some knots. Um, doing this means it doesn't have to be super tight and it won't go anywhere. So I really like doing the uh, strings going around the top and the bottom. So I'll show you how I attach them now real quick. So you just put your thread through the holes you've created. My holes are a bit too small for this thread. This thread is a bit too big. Um, like so. And the first knot you wanna do if you're working with paper uh, shouldn't be too tight, should just be loose, and then the second knot is what's tight, or else you'll rip the paper. Um, so the second knot is what's tight. Now you bring this around to the other side. Using a toothpick to get it through because it doesn't want to go through today. <laughs> Um, and the same with this one, remember it should be, the first knot should be loose so that it doesn't rip the paper and then the second knot is what's tight. Um, And then the last string goes from the top from here. I don't know if you guys can hear the lovely rain outside. Um, oh, I know I might be going over time, but I'm almost finished. Um, So tie your double knot. And then you tie the other end. You're gonna to wanna to test this out on your own head, exactly how, how, where you're gonna to wanna to tie the knot, but you tie it so it has this, uh, this three, so it doesn't have to be tied on the back of your head, it'll just sit and it won't go anywhere. Um, and you tie another knot, a double knot, in the center of the horizontal string. Um, so really quickly now I'm going to attach your beak and your uh, puppet, and then it'll be done. So this is how we're going to attach it. Uh, if it's glue, it'll be a bit different, but if it's sellotape, I'd like to get my sellotape ready before I line everything up. So I get roughly the size I need. 
I have that ready on this on the side of my desk. I don't know if you can see it. I have it ready here. And then I place the center of the mask, the center of the flat, on the uh, on the beak. And we're just going to saute down around the edges to bring all the mask together. We're going to do the same on the other side. So get your piece of salad tape ready. Oops. And set it tape down the flaps that you made. And then you basically need to. Uh, the paper slightly, get it into the shape you want it to be, and you're basically done. And then you have your plague doctor steampunk inspired mask with uh, a movable cob. Sorry, I might, maybe I went slightly over time, but that's it. <laughs> so good, thank you. I'm just going to put my video back on. Thank you so much, Megan. That was that was absolutely amazing. It was so clever, so creative. I love the steampunk aesthetic, but I don't think I could have done that. How did you guys get on? Um, please don't worry if you guys didn't get finished or if you'd like to add more color or have more time to decorate. We'll be reposting this video in a couple of weeks to our Ch uh, Chester Beatty YouTube channel. So please pop on there and subscribe to our channel. So now we're going to have a Q&A session. This is part of Dublin Maker. So I'm going to give you some time to get your questions in now. So if you're watching on Zoom, please pop any questions you have for Megan or Dublin Maker onto our Q&A se Q um, segment there. And if you're watching live through Dublin Maker's YouTube channel, please pop your questions into the chat there and we can go through those too. So while you're getting your questions down, I just want to remind you that we would love to hear from you and see all the created work that you've done. We would absolutely love to see your finished product. So please send us any images that you may have to Chester Beatty online at cbl.ie because we would love to see what you've managed to create. Just a reminder that at the Chester Beatty, we have plenty more events and activities coming up that are available to book right now. So please go to our website, chesterbeatty.ie and go to what's on so you can sign up there and see whatever we have coming up as we approach Christmas. So I can see we have some questions popping in for Megan and um, for Dublin Maker. So I'm gonna pass you over now to Jeffrey from Dublin Maker who'll go through any questions, have a little chat and close the event. Thank you. Jeffrey, it looks great. I should wear mine, mine as well. Yeah, I struggled a bit now with the with the cog part. I didn't really have a, a small enough scissors, and I uh, okay. butchered it with, with my scissors. I got a large scissors, and I kind of butchered it uh, fairly well. Uh, so it looks like I don't have access to the Q and A uh, aspect of it uh, in Zoom. So I guess I'll ask uh, I'll ask a question while we sort out that access first. Is uh, what what changes would you make to add a bit more longevity to it? You know, um, I know it's out of paper and stuff. What what changes would you make to you know make it last a bit longer? Yeah, I mean, I would probably use a. I wanted to try to keep it with materials that you might have around the house, but if you had something slightly thicker, um, not too thick because you know you need to fold and stuff, but slightly thicker paper would be better. Um, I found that even with slightly thicker paper or with any paper, adding wax crayon, which I did for this one, like adds a water kind of proof element slightly, or like it adds uh, definitely more sterility to the paper, that wax, waxy kind of finish, and it makes it shiny. Um, so yeah, I don't know, I love wax crayons. That's one of my favorite things to work with. So, <laughs> um, Yeah, uh, another thing would be uh, using sellotape on some of the uh, holes that you made to use the, to uh, make the thread, make sure they don't rip. Um, can't really see it so it doesn't ruin anything but it just gives it a bit more sterility because that's where masks usually rip. Um, yeah 
I think that's basically it. All right. And have you ever considered, a go, a, I guess, going a bit uh, mixed medium and maybe have some flashing lights or other aspects of steampunk to it? Yeah, I would love to do that because I, I work occasionally with LEDs. And um, yeah, I, I don't know how much people have at home. Like I, I have so much of this stuff and then I'm like, oh, yeah, people have uh, wires, don't they? And they're like, no. <laughs> people don't have wires. <laughs> so uh, but maybe in the future. Yeah, I would, I would love to add them. Hi, it's, it's Justina here. I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in for a second. I have to say this is our fault that we keep it relatively simple. Um, because of level five, we cannot go and prepare packs and send them to people. Um, and shops are closed, and we just didn't feel it's fair to exclude people simply because they don't have batteries at home or LED lights or anything like that. But when we do these workshops in house in the Chester BT, they must certainly include all of these elements. So this is definitely something that we just thought go simple, but allow everybody who wants to participate in. Yeah, exactly. Thanks, sorry for jumping in. <laughs> yeah, I see Tomas has a uh, question there. Um, hold on. Uh, how about a paper mache version? Would it be difficult? Um, I've not tried a paper mache version, but I've seen others do it. Um, I love paper mache. It takes a bit more time, obviously. Um, yeah, that would be a way of making it super sturdy. Um, quite heavy, though. I feel like it might be slightly heavy. <laughs> yeah, and heavier it's than full paper. on, full on. The, you know, you need support at the back, I suppose. Yeah, um, I was trying to make it as simple as possible as well with the uh, pattern. So like. And um, you can see online if you're making it out of leather or like materials, there's very complicated patterns and I've just never been one for following them. So it's like trying to cut it down and be like, what's the simplest way I can make this? So it doesn't have loads of different pieces. Um, but if you're good at pattern making and sewing, then yeah, you can make it out of leather as well. It'd be really cool. <laughs> so how did you find the process, Jeffrey? Uh, yeah, I struggled with the small scissors, as I said uh, earlier. Uh, I didn't have any strings, so I, I had uh, a reel of uh, cable that I cut up for the for, for the string part. Oh, well, uh, that would work well. I had some yeah. hot glue because I realized I didn't have any uh, any uh, blue tack or anything like that. Hot but, glue uh, would work actually. That's one thing that I was originally going to use, and then I realized maybe maybe it wouldn't be the best if people wouldn't have it. But hot glue would work really well instead of blue tack. It'd work better actually. But, um, oh, Tomas mentioned it'd be fun to integrate a face mask as well, i.e. a COVID mask. I think I have seen people, when early days with the face mask and stuff, people start doing the plate doctor, you know, implement it on top of their face mask. I think I have seen those. Yeah, yeah why not? And then you, have, then you, can, <laughs> you can also, you know, this is a self-enclosed beak, so you could add some uh, nice smelling flowers in there if you wanted to keep it very traditional, <laughs> like the originals, some dried flowers. So do you have any questions from the from the Zoom webinar? Nothing coming through on Zoom anymore. So yeah. Um, oh, Tomas has another one. How were the original seventeenth century masks made? Um, as far Are you as material. I, as far as I know, they would have been made from leather. Um, they're made from leather the goggles were glass there was always like a glass pane and then there was like two little holes where so they could breathe and they breathed it in through the beak and through the the flowers and the, the spices and stuff because oh, yeah. they believed that if they couldn't smell anything bad then um they wouldn't get sick like that's how that's how they thought um but yeah i think leather mostly as far as i know and just generally, Megan, in, in your process, do you uh, first kind of come up with your concept and then look around your house going, oh, what sort of materials do I have? Or which part comes first? Do you look at materials and then decide what to make? Um, no, I think that probably would have been a better way of doing it, but I don't, <laughs> I don't do it that way. I usually like have an idea or I see something that I'm like, okay, I want to do something like that. And then I try to reverse it into like, okay, how can I make this very simple? How can I like simplify this element or like uh, use materials that are yeah very easy to access um 
and then I, you know, look online to see if other people have done it in different ways. And I try to like take bits from different inspiration. Um, yeah, that's usually how I do it. Okay, I think that's all our questions for today. Yeah, so I think that is about it. So if we, we'll probably just wrap it up there. So thank you again, Dublin Maker, first of all, for collaborating with us on this. Thank you so much, Megan. That was an absolutely amazing workshop. And we hope that you out there on Zoom and on YouTube, that you all enjoyed it and that you'll be able to redo it over and over again and enjoy the rest of Science Week. Um, Vicky, do you, do you want to name some of the things that are coming up with Science Week with Dublin Maker? Yeah, we just have one more uh, Maker a Day event. It's um, if for definitely for those who are working from home, if you want to make your own wooden, an ergonomic wooden laptop folding stand. So um, get your woodworking gear, <laughs> get your fine piece of wood and your saws and stuff. So um, he'll be actually um, showing you um, uh, how he actually made it. So I think he has the full thing where he takes it apart and he rebuilds it again. So it'll be a great one, especially if you want to, get away from the computer um well obviously watching this video like that no coding or electronics but this is like just making your own laptop stand so that's happening at one o'clock so in a few minutes so it'll be on the exact for those who are watching on youtube is the exact same um uh, youtube stream so stay on if you're if you're interested in uh, making your laptop stand fantastic and any of you on zoom who'd like to take part in that head over to youtube go to the dublin maker uh, channel subscribe to them and you can watch everything that they have going on at the moment so thank you so much guys and we hope to see you all thank again thank you as well and it's a pleasure and yeah check out your youtube you're doing a lot of cool stuff on chester vt as well so, <laughs> thank you uh, <laughs> so thanks again bye bye, bye guys. All right.
Um, oh no, hold on. Give me a second. Uh, there is a problem. I forgot that, uh, I am still on the other Zoom. Hold on. <laughs> There you go. Hello. Slight technical glitch. It was from the previous webinar. So, um, hi everyone. Welcome back again for those who are staying with us and those who are new. Um, we are on our final session today uh, where you get a chance to um, make your own uh, ergonomic wooden folding laptop stand. Um, so for those who don't know, uh, I'm Vicky um, and there's Jeffrey and David from the Double Maker team. Uh, we run uh, Maker Festival every year, except for this year uh, because of COVID. So we missed all our makers. So we decided to bring some of our makers along and um, so they can show some of their projects and also do some workshops and sh share with everyone who would like to join along. The videos, we're live streaming this, so uh, but the videos will be up for you if you missed, um, if you missed it or um, if you kind of um, uh, want to catch up and follow up the parts that you missed out. Um, but if you have any questions, um, do put it on live chat and we will um, ask them at the end of the workshop. So without further ado, I will hand you over to James, who will um, start the workshop or introduce yourself as well. <laughs> yeah, thanks very much. Um, so thank you very much for uh, the opportunity to show off my wares. Um, so I'm James. Uh, I I'm a maker based in Dublin um, and mostly based out of the TOG hackerspace as well, um, which uh, everybody on the Dublin Maker team is uh, quite involved in. So um, a big thank you to Dublin Maker, big thank you to TOG as well. Um, and so my, the, my background is uh, in software engineering. Um, and I suppose the reason why I wanted to show off uh, this particular um, uh, project here is because I suppose everyone has in the last six months or so has been, been working from home. Um, and I suppose that's been a challenge for a lot of people. Um, and it's been a challenge in terms of, uh, you know, people who are working in the city, working um, in uh, accommodation like, like ourselves, we're in a one bedroom uh, apartments in here in the, in the city. So, you know, we had to kind of uh, make do um, with what space we had. So um, I myself have been working from the bedroom um, and my fiance has been working from the living room inside. Um, so, you know, we've been working in a tight space and we kind of have been, um, you know, working on projects to innovate and to make that a little bit more comfortable. Um, so one project is a folding uh, laptop stand. So this is what I work, uh, use, this is what I use um, every day to work from, uh, work from the bedroom. Um, so I have a laptop set up here. And then I also have a, another stand just beside it um, here that folds down and um, which holds my, my iPad. Um, and I actually can use them as two, two screens then to, to work at the desk. Um, and I also have a, a chair here. So in terms of, um, in terms of ergonomics, you know, uh, the best practices is always to have a, um, a screen that's up at your eye height. Um, and I happen to be six foot four. So that tends to be quite high. Um, so I wanted to build a kind of a robust um, box, you know, most people are using books or cardboard or something like that. And, um, and I wanted to build something that was a little bit more robust. Um, and I actually built this, pro this particular project um, before lockdown when I was working in a, a, a hot desking space uh, based out of Dogpatch Labs. So they're a co-working uh, community in, um, in CHQ building down in the docks. Um, and they have this cool aesthetic with like plywood and an and OSB plywood like this. Um, where, uh, you know, they have furniture, custom furniture built with all this kind of, this type of plywood. Um, so I built this originally, um, this time last year, probably, um, to work out of that hot desking space. And, and the idea with that is it needed to fold up and fold away at, at the end of every day, because, um, you know, you don't really leave anything on a, on a hot desk when you're finished for the day. Um, so the idea is we'd be able to fold this up, put my keyboard and my mouse, um, uh, which you know I have to to set up beside me, so I'm working here. I'm typing here, and I'm using my mouse here, but my screen is up here. Um, so the idea is that we be able to fold that, all that down at the end of the day, and then tuck it away somewhere in Dogpatch, um, or uh, so that it would be out of the way. And then the next time I go to use it, it's very easy to set it back up. Um, so that was the the intention with this, and that's kind of where the the OSB uh, OSB kind of plywood design came from. Um, but I'm actually in my bedroom at the moment with a different piece of furniture, um, a piece of furniture that I'm gonna show off now um, in, in a live demo way. So it might be a little bit um, clunky, but I'm gonna show it off because I think this is another project for working from home. Uh, it might be int uh, of interest to people. Um, so I'm just gonna show you what uh, this bedroom uh, can do uh, with this piece of furniture. So bear with me now while I take this down. So the laptop comes away. 
Um, the iPad stand can fold down, just show you. The iPad stand folds down, and then it's essentially a hollow box, but there's a ridge on the inside where the laptop sits. Um, and then with a little little up, um, pull of a, a strut that I have set in here, the, the entire box will actually fold down. And then the idea is the keyboard can come in and sit inside here, and the mouse can also sit inside there. And then when it folds, it moves away, and then you can put it somewhere else. So I'm just going to put this somewhere else for the moment. And then I'll give you a demo of my work table, which is here. It's a two double leaf work table. But when I fold it, it actually goes up into a cabinet here and tucks away. And if I kind of zoom out by manually moving my iPad awkwardly while I'm doing this, so now you can see more of the bedroom and you can see more of there. So the, the table's here. And then I also have a storage cabinet up the top and a storage cabinet down the bottom. But the most interesting part about this, I know I'm off screen, but I'll be back in a second. The most interesting part about this is this is where the bed comes from. So in actual fact, this bedroom becomes an entire home office because it's not a huge room. This is only really uh, large enough to fit the bed and to fit the, the wardrobe and so on. So in, in actual fact, this piece of furniture transforms the space and we actually can get rid of the bed when we're not using it and then turn it into a um, home office for myself to home theater for watching movies or in actual fact, um, my fiance, Lauren, is uh, teaching the tap dance class at the moment. She's, I had to kick her out of the, the room, but she would usually teach the tap dance class in the bedroom. So this room almost comes like a dance studio. So this is the idea that um, I've been working on. This project is a lot, uh, it's been going on for a lot longer. This project is probably about six years old. Um, and I've been working on various different iterations, but we finished that particular project the week before lockdown. So I've been able to work from my home office, my convertible home office every day since then. So that's all it is. It's a, it's a very simple design that the, the bed goes up, the table comes out, and then my folding laptop stand comes back to become part of the home office. So I'm just gonna bring this back up now. So now we can take out our keyboard, some mouse, and set up the laptop stand again. So I suppose, what we're going to do now is they're going to actually build a new one. So I'm going to show you how that works. So this, as I showed you earlier on, folds up and inside are hinges. So there are hinges on the inside of this folding leaf here. I'm going to take this apart so you can see it a bit better. And then on the front side, there are hinges on this way on the outside. So that means that it folds up like a box like this. So I'm gonna take it apart now so you can see the, the, the detail of the inside. In addition, then we'll also make a new one so that you can see how it can be done from scratch. So this is all just put together with hinges and screws. So it can all be taken back apart again. One screw. This is where the live video gets a little bit tedious sometimes. Hopefully it all goes well. So if you have any questions while I'm doing this, uh, Vicky and the guys are gonna be keeping track of the YouTube. Uh, YouTube live videos and all the questions and answers. So feel free to drop questions in there while I'm doing this. And it'll make for an interesting session later on to see if I can actually answer this, answer the questions. So I've been woodworking and, and making things for, well, since I was a little kid, my dad and my family were quite um, handy. Um, and they taught me a few things. And then I suppose because we're on YouTube live, I have to give YouTube a plug as well. I've, I've uh, learned a lot from you know, searching for things, how to weld, how to 
you know, do cove cuts on a table saw, how to do all sorts of interesting things. So there's four screws, usually there'd be eight, but I took out two, four already, so that I'd make this a little bit quicker. So now you can see the insides. Now you can see that there are hinges on the, on the inside here, and there's a miter cut. So this is a 45 degree cut, so that when the joint opens up, it actually meets at, it meets at the top. That's what's called a miter cut. And so I suppose that's what's that, that's one of the most difficult parts of this project is actually to get those miter cuts right because I mean it's easy to make a straight cut, but the miter cut is, is a difficult part. So I'm going to show you how to make that a little bit easier in the next iteration when I go to make that. So the idea here is I'm just gonna move this back a bit. The idea here is that on the inside the hinges um are moving uh, on, on the internal edge of the box. Um, and that allows the, the, the two leaves to kind of fold on top of each other. Um, and then it creates this sort of box on the inside here where you can put the keyboard and the mouse. And then this is your ridge for the laptop that sits on top of the, on top of the box when it's actually open. And then you have the, the hinges on the inside and they are actually, they hinge on the, on the external face so you can see them popping through on the outside. And the idea with that then is that they're the ones that will fold flat when the, the laptop stand opens. So I hope that makes sense. If there's any clarification needed on that, drop a question into the YouTube live and we'll see where we go from there. Um, but I suppose the, the next part about, about all this is I want to actually build a new one. So I'm actually gonna put this away over here. And I'm going to bring out the parts, all the separate parts that you need to build when you're building this from scratch. So you need four, part, four bits of wood. And the new design for this, I wanted to match the, the actual tabletop and the, and the cabinetry here. So I'm using birch plywood, um, which is a nice finish. And on the inside for the ridge, you can see that it's got nice layers of plywood as well. So it's quite a modern look, but on the outside, that wood, that birch plywood is the same as the plywood for the table. So I'm doing that, but you can actually use whatever sort of materials you like. You could go with acrylic or something cool like that. You could go with OSB or something like this pink hard, hard, hardboard backed plywood that's here. So all the parts. These parts are actually the sides. These two parts here, um, they're going to uh, be folding flat inwards and these two parts are going to be opposing each other. So they actually look a bit like this when they're being put together. And so here I've already made um, and I've already glued up the ridges on both sides, um, but I'm gonna show you how to do that as well in a second. So we have all our pieces, these are all our sides and these are actually thinner than the original because I want to make the box a little bit lighter than before. Um, but there, the, this, the, the sides, I'm also going to then bring the, the ridges, the pieces that are going to sit on the inside, and I'll show you those as well. So we have the smaller pieces for the sides, and we have the larger pieces for the front and the back. And so when you're doing woodwork, it's always kind of very important to Make sure that you have all your parts laid out so you can kind of see where you are um, and you can kind of keep track and kind of make sure that you're measuring uh, measuring correctly and when you're measuring you always have to measure the old saying goes uh, measure twice cut once so when you're measuring you got to make sure that you you measure it and so what i usually do is whenever there's something to measure off like in this case we obviously have to measure off the laptop because it has to hold this laptop so when I measure off this, I will go and measure it here from, from here to here. And then I'll add a little bit so it slots in easily. Um, so in this case, I get my measuring tape. And so this laptop is 304 millimeters. I always work in millimeters because it's a more accurate and, and you don't have to be dealing a decimal point. So millimeters, 304 millimeters by 211. So when you're actually then making this, obviously I've cut these already, but if you were to measure out a piece of wood, you can measure out, then draw your line, 
And then when you actually draw the full line, if you want to make a straight cut, you'll be measuring it at the top, measuring it in the middle, measuring it at the bottom. And then you'll be getting a ruler and you'll be drawing a line straight across all of those. And so what I usually do at that point is do my second measurement. So I'll come back here and make sure that I was correct. So 304 millimeters and I'll come back to the point where I've already drawn my line and make sure that that line is correct before I cut. And that's how you go about ensuring that you haven't missed something or that you haven't misread something, you haven't gone in inches instead of millimeters or something silly like that. Um, and more often than not, it's a silly mistake. More often than not, it's not a calculation or anything like that. It's just a silly mistake. You you know misread the, the numbers or put the millimeters in the wrong way. It's so easy to get this mixed up if you're working on a project for a long time or if you're new to this. So it's always better to double check. So you measure off your, your unit to start with, measure off to make your, um, uh, your, your uh, lines, then you draw your big line for your cut, but then you go back to your original, back to your laptop, take your measurement again and make sure that the line, the long line is actually correct. And so that's how I went about doing this. And so I started off with a big sheet of plywood and in actual fact, just to give Tog another plug, this is actually plywood that Tog would have underneath their laser cutter. So it's three mil plywood, birch ply. It works really well to cut out of the laser, the laser cutter. So actually what you could do is actually cut all of this out of, the, uh, out of this plywood using the laser cutter itself um, if you wanted to. I'm not so used to that. I actually prefer to do things by hand sometimes, but the laser cutter is very quick and very handy. And you can actually create a design that you can then cut multiple times. And it makes it very quick to do multiple versions of this. Um, but anyway, we're not doing that for the moment. We're cutting it all manually. So that's where these, these strips of wood come from, these, these uh, planks of wood. But then these are actually where the hinges are going to go. So I have an example here of, of the hinges that are actually put in place already. And we're gonna put the hinges in place first because we want to make sure that if the screws pop out, which they do actually here on this side, the screws actually popped out. And they do that sometimes because I mean, screws are longer than the piece of wood. We obviously got only a small piece of wood there to attach to. But what we, what we can do is we can get a pliers and cut off the ends and then file it down with an, even an emery board from, for, for nails, or um, we can use a, a metal file to actually get rid of the ends of the screws there. So as you can see, they actually are quite flush in comparison to when they would have been sticking out right the way through the wood. And we do that beforehand so that we can, when we're gluing it down, we can glue it down flush to the piece of, um, uh, to, to the actual uh, sheet of material that we want as the wall. So in order to cut these, these are actually made out of plywood, 18 mil plywood. So I had this um, lying around because I've actually built all this, the cabinetry for the bed already. So I had um, this kind of uh, plywood already lying around and then I cut it down to size and cut it with a miter edge again. And we'll talk a bit more, more about the miter edge in a minute as well. But the miter edge um, and the actual plywood comes from a strip of wood that I had left over here. So this was my original strip of wood. And I actually just cut it down the center. Not exactly straight, but you'll forgive me for that. Um, I had this original piece of wood. It's about, it's about two inches wide, so 25 millimeters. And as it happens, those hinges are one inch hinges. They're 25 millimeters. So I wanted them to be, to be the right size. So I cut this right down the middle and this just turned out to be the perfect piece of wood to do that. Um, and so there's loads of ways to actually cut this wood, loads of them. Um, so I'm going to give you an idea of, of, of how I would do it um, if I was in a shop like Tog um, or if I had bare minimum of tools, I would, I would use a handsaw as well. But this is a circular saw blade for um, a table saw or for a circular saw that you would use in a workshop. Um, and these are really good because you would have a fence where you could actually pass this piece of wood in and it will chop it right the way you want it. And if you don't want to do a miter cut, you can. If you want to do a straight cut, you can. This is for experienced people only, and you have to be very careful with this because obviously a table saw is a very um, dangerous piece of kit and you have to be well trained up on how to use it. The obvious other um, answer, uh, the total other end of the spectrum is a handsaw. And so I really like this handsaw because it's actually a shorter length and it actually fits right in, inside of normal toolboxes. So you can pick these up in hardware stores. They're essentially toolbox saws. And they're really nice to, to use because you can ha have them around the apartment and they don't take up huge amount of space. They're not awkward. Um, and if you do have a small toolbox, you can actually fit these in there. 
So I recommend these be, uh, because they're easy to have in a one bedroom apartment like we have. Um, so the idea with that then is you could actually just pass the, the saw through the blade and then you could cut it all the way down the center. And then when you're doing your miter cuts, you come this way and you cut this way or more rightly, you would actually sit it up straight and you would cut it a straight um, in terms of a vertical, but you would cut it at the, at the miter um, uh, 45 degrees. So that way you get a clean cut all the way down and you have to just take your time. This is the main thing with this, because obviously uh, it, it, it takes a lot of kind of uh, patience to get the cut right. When you're actually starting the cut, you want to make sure that, you know, you, you have your, your, your finger away from the blade, but you're using a knuckle to keep it steady. So I'll just give an ex example of that. What I'm doing here, I'm gonna get the angle right. What I'm doing here is I'm using one knuckle and then the, the, the reason why the saw blade is so wide is because you can actually use the blade to, 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 um, to essentially steady yourself. So what I have is I have my knuckle against the, the piece of wood here. I'm just gonna set this a little bit better. A knuckle against the piece of wood here. And then I can actually lean against this knuckle and start cutting until I have a good edge. And then I can take my hand away if I wish, because I already have a groove set into the wood and it's going to give me a good um, steady place to keep the, the saw, saw blade going up back and forth. So that's the idea there, just to keep um, this uh, it's steady. And in actual fact, that's how I set all this stuff up. So I did all this with this because I don't have access to TOG right now and I'm only in my apartment. So that was the way I did all this, was actually just through a handsaw. Okay, the next step then is once you have all your pieces done and you have all of your 45 degrees, the hinges come next. So I'm gonna take all this stuff away. I'm gonna come over towards the camera I'm going to give an example of how to do this. So what I have here is a lot of screws. I don't know if you can see that. A lot of screws and hinges. So small screws that will fit in flush to the, to the hinge because the hinges have what's called a countersink in, in it where there's a little groove where the, the, the screw can sit into. And that will mean that when, when, the, when the screw is fully into the, into the hinge, it will sit flush and that's it gives a nice finish. So I have these set up here. I'm gonna take a two hinges. And the idea with this is when we're putting the two sides together, we want the flat hinge, I don't know if you can see this now yet, the flat hinge, that goes to the external side, meets up with the piece of wood here that's gonna take the same, the, the opposite edge of that flat hinge. And that's it. the same thing happens then for the other side on the bottom of the box. So this hinge will sit here. And then on the outside and this part here, this will meet up with the other, other pieces of wood to, fo to form the opposite end of the uh, box. And this will be the internal side. So this will actually sit on top here and receive the internal side. So like we have here where the, where the miter edges of the box are, are actually facing away from each other, they open out. That's what's going to happen here in this part. So when you're dealing with this, a tip, tip that I like to give people is when you're dealing with very, very small screws, ones like these where they're so small, you can't really get any sort of grip. And they also have a Phillips head, which is sort of hard to get, you know, to, to get a start in the screw. What you can do is you can get a long screw that has probably a Phillips head, which is a little bit easier to use, just to start, just, so, just to start the hole. And that we can do by setting up the screwdriver with a proper, so the, these screws are, a large head, so they have a Posi Drive 2 head. This is a Posi Drive 2 screw, uh, driver. And this is kind of important so you don't wreck the threads of the screw itself, that you don't wreck the tops of the heads. You gotta get those right and you gotta get those lined up. And then I find my pencil, because I left that somewhere, there you go. So I want this to sit right at the edge of where the miter is. 
And the easiest way to do that is to actually just fold, fold the hinge down so that it sits, sits right kind of naturally between the two sides. And then if you just draw a hole on the top piece, that gives you two holes to work with. And then you can actually fix your screw. You just get a few turns in that so that it, you actually have a hole to start with. So that just gives you something that the, the next screw, the real screw can actually fit into, gives it some shape so that the screw doesn't bounce around the place. And you do the same with the second hole. Okay, so that's two holes started. And then we fit the small screws. So we take out the posi drive head, the Phillips head. We put in a flat head for these types of screws. And then we get our screw. Actually, we get two screws and we'll just put them in the holes by hand. At the moment. And then we finish it off with the screwdriver. So now you can see what I meant by the countersink. So it's actually very difficult from the side to see these, these screws because they're, they're countersunk into the screws. So you only barely see the heads coming up over the top of the screw. And that's useful because this part, when it's attached to the other piece of wood, will fall down on top of it. And you don't want there to be too much in the way there before, so that it can fold flat. And so that's really important. You find small screws that fit into the countersink in, in a good way so that these will fold correctly. And it's sometimes difficult to find these screws. So you can do other things like, you know, once you have the screw uh, uh, put in, you can actually get your metal file and you can just brush the top off and that will allow the screws to fold in on top of each other without getting in the way. But obviously that's more work. So you can, if you can find the right screws, that's obviously the, the best way to go. So we've done that now. And I'm not gonna bore you with doing that again, another, what is it, eight times, 16 times? So I'm just gonna lay all this out so that you understand how this all fits together. And then I'm gonna show you how it would fit and it would all come together using the existing piece of wood. So laying all this out, I'm just gonna create some space. Laying all this out, this piece, if it was already assembled, would come here. Then we would actually have, a, so it's a small piece, larger piece, the front or the back, then the side, small piece again, and then a larger piece. And so this would fold up just like a cardboard box would. If you were to lift all this up and roll it over to this edge, that will form your box. And so this is important now. So if you had all of these parts laid out and all of your hinges attached, in the right places, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, you lay out all your all your hinges. This would be the part where you can roll all this up, and all of your screws would be in place, except for the, the 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 this this end here, except for this end here, and except for this end here. And then when you fold all this up together, it um it's it's how it comes together as a box. So the one thing I haven't said yet, which I'm going to uh, talk about now is actually getting these bits of wood attached to this piece of wood here. So once you have your your hinges attached properly, the next part then is to actually fix that to your piece of wood. So I suppose what you have to do is find 
the depth of the laptop that you want to actually sit in. So for this, um, the laptop is quite slim. So I wanted the laptop to fit just above where the, the top of the box starts. And that's so that it, you can see the laptop when the laptop opens, the laptop is right flush against the, this edge here is right flush against the top of the box, which makes it look very slick when it's actually open. But also it means that you can grab the hinge, you can grab the, the laptop screen and open it easily. Um, so this is important to, to measure the, uh, the box and then to save you going and using a measuring tape and, and, and uh, uh, trying to you know, measure all this up, easiest thing to do is to go find something around the house that actually has the right, the same sort of thickness. So what I found for my laptop in particular was a box of Tesco chocolate. Definitely the best way to go and measure. So when I put this down on the, on, on the ground like this, this is actually the right thickness for my laptop. So it's the same thickness. And then that way you can use this, which is less awkward to carry around. You can use this. You put a piece of glue on the bottom of your piece and then you can use the piece of chocolate, the, the piece of uh, the box of chocolate um, to just measure up and make sure that that's the right thickness. That's the right width away because you don't want it to be too deep because then your laptop will be sitting in behind underneath the box and you don't want it to be flush on the top or too flush on the top because that means that the laptop could move around the place. So you want the laptop to be nice and flush to the top here. The way I like it is so that the screen, the laptop screen sits above it and the keyboard sits level. And so that is why I found this piece of chocolate to go and organize the, the thickness. So that way you can put this up against the edge and you can put your glue uh, on the underside of this, put it all together and then just form it up. Just hold it in place, form it up. And then you can kind of move that to a safe space where it's not gonna get kicked. It's not gonna get moved. And then you have a piece of wood like this. Here's one I made earlier that has the wood already stuck and it has a nice edge on it where the laptop can sit. And so I put on top and bottom, I did it equally in the same kind of uh, distance just for um, ease of use. So uh, in actual fact, you could use the, the, the box this way or actually the other way around if you wanted to, um, but we'll see how that finishes up. So that is all the parts of the, of the, of the build for this box. And then it's just about assembling all the hinges and putting it all together. But in order to demonstrate that, I'm actually going to use the old box. So I'm gonna take all this stuff away for the moment. And obviously when this is finished, I'll put up pictures on this on Instagram and maybe Dublin Makers as well, um, so that everyone can see the finished box. But for now, we'll go back to the original. So, like I said to you before, we have the outside edges and um, with the hinges on the inside, and we have the inside edges that have the hinges on the outside, the external facing sides. And so in order to actually fix this together, it would be quite awkward unless we had these mitered edges. So what we need to do when we have our two sides fixed up is to actually, first of all, we need to put them the right way. Then we have two, two edges that are already folding and already stuck together. But we would have an edge here and an edge on the back that we also need to fix up. So I would recommend that all, all the hinges are connected. We, you know, we, we connect all the hinges up first. And then in order to actually put this all together, you have the holes in the boxes already set up. It's difficult to see in the OSB because it's so wavy, um, but there's actually holes already set up in here. And so this will allow us to just offer this up, find out where the, the holes are, make sure that they can be put back, back in the same place. And then we can actually screw this back together. So I'm just gonna screw it back together now and show you. It's a little bit finicky, but you can get it, get it to line up. And that's the most important part. So you do that beforehand then this part will be easier to do. So you get your screw, you put it back in the hole that was being created. A 
little bit finicky. Very finicky, in fact. There you go. And we get our screw back in. Don't, don't know if you can see that, but I'm getting the screw back in here now. So that's one screw in. I'll do the other one in a minute. But just to give you an example, that's that one box with, with all the hinges set up. It's just the last hinge to go in place to make it a functional and standing box. Same thing again here, where we line this up, find the hole, and screw it in. So there are other screws to do, but we don't need to do that right now, but just to give you a demonstration of how that all sits together now as well. See that? Okay. So now the box is back doing that folding uh, action that we had before, where when we don't, we don't want it, we can fold it away. And then when we do want it, we can actually open it back up and then you have your laptop bridge in here so that when you have it up on your desk, you can actually fit your laptop in. So there you go. You can open your laptop up there. So I actually made a cutout in this one in order to be able to get at the, um, the lip to lift up the, the screen. And I suppose you could do the same thing again. You could get um, a drill and drill out a little hole and then you get your saw in there and there and then if you have another little saw or just making lots of um, straight cuts here, and then you can chisel it out or something like that. And that, that's what gives you that kind of little cut out there. The last thing to note before I wrap up is that actually there's not a lot of structure in this. When you want it to stand up, it will actually start to move around a bit. So this is one where I'd be really interested to get some suggestions from people. So I know we ask for questions and, and things like that, but actually suggestions would be great because what I can, what I have in here is a piece of metal. Probably hard to see. There's a piece of metal in here that's been kind of stuck in with a, a, a rounded nail, um, and that piece of metal is kind of like a, a a strut that goes across the angle, and it sits into another piece of metal that I have down here. So down here is another piece of metal. I hope you can see it. And then there's just a little loop on this. And in order for it to be to become a strong box, you kind of need to triangulate it. You need to have a strong center. So with, with this then, the idea is you can simply clip this in to the round nail. And then that actually stops the box from moving around. And it makes it easy then when you put the box up that you don't have to angle it any foot anymore before you can drop your laptop in. But I'd be very keen to figure out if anybody has any better ideas for doing that because it's a little bit clunky. So it's the only part of the setup that requires a little bit of you know fooling around in order to get it to 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 behave itself. But other than that, you just unclip it, you put your um, keyboard in your mouse, and ideally you, you could also put your laptop in there as well. Fold it away, and then for the likes of ourselves, where actually this is our bedroom, we just put it under the bed and bring the bed all the way back down again. So, Vicky, I think we can leave it there. Um, I hope that made sense. I hope people got something from that and some tips for assembling these kind of boxes and, and laptop stands. And uh, yeah, if anybody has any questions or things like that, we can go, go to the questions and answers. Oh, wow. I think uh, that, that, that start before you did the, um, took apart the uh, stand with your um, worktop and your bed. I think uh, everyone just, I think, oh, well, my jaw dropped anyway. That was amazing. <laughs> Did not expect cool, that right? at all. I mean, yeah, so cool. It, it, it was a project that we're so lucky to actually get finished just before lockdown, you know, because it's been actually such a savior for us to be able to, you know, both work from here. So unfortunately, my headset just died as we moved to questions and answers. So I'm just going to 
reset this uh, this iPad okay. on the table. Oh, I'm just scrolling back to the questions. Um, this is not relating to the stand, uh, but uh, Tomas was asking, what is supporting the other end of the bed? What's supporting the other end of the bed? Yes. <laughs> um, so the other end of the bed, so um, we actually, it's a four poster bed design. Um, so the, the cabinets are here. But actually, this is one leg of a four poster bed design. So they, if you see this, this is kind of like your headboard for your bed. This is the, um, the post. And then there's actually four legs. So there's a, another two legs on the other side of the room. Um, so yeah, that's, that's how that works. OK, um, I think, Jeffrey, that's your question. Then after that, do you want to ask that? Uh, finishing the wood? Yeah, the question is, uh, especially kind of the OSB, do you, do you apply a finish to it? Does dust come off it over time? Uh, I wouldn't want them sucked into the fan of your laptop there. What sort yeah. of uh, finishing? Pre thing? Precisely, yeah. So, I mean, with this, um, you know, dust and everything like that wears away over time. And, and I suppose what you can do is um, you can use the likes of uh, rubbing alcohol or something like that. Um, and actually, when you apply alcohol to wood, like a, a untextured wood like this, um, it will actually it will make the grain expand and it's actually much easier to actually get rid of all textures and things like that when you do that then you wait for the alcohol to kind of to evaporate to 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 to, to go away before you apply any finishes for this i've actually left it unfinished um but generally speaking with uh, the likes of osb people would use a polyurethane um a kind of a um wipe on wipe off polyurethane or actually something thicker um, to get a really clean finish over the top because obviously OSB is really kind of messy. Like there's there's grain everywhere and, and you know, it can get quite um, messy. So you can sand it down just to a, a regular finish and that actually works quite well, um, uh, which means that you're not going to get splinters off the top of it. But generally speaking, if people are putting furniture or things like that into it, the, uh, you know, so for people to be sitting on or to, to be rubbing against, they would use some something like polyurethane um, and, and put it on quite thick so that it kind of covers over the, the, the grain of the wood. The next question is actually from David. Do you want to ask it or do you want me to ask your question? Right, well, I, I have two questions while I'm at it. Right. Uh, well, one, one goes back to the bed. How worried are you, are you to be the first person to be killed by their own bed uh, as, you, as it's over your head? Do you, do you have complete belief in your own engineering? Um, um, my actual question was about the box was more about just about your design process, James, about, um, how did you, do you go and make a sketch beforehand or do CAD or anything like that? Or do you just get pieces of wood and start like, you know, it's all in your mind and you start chopping them up. So, um, I'm going to plug, plug, um, these, these, uh, these notepads. I use, um, these, uh, what, what are they called? Lectern notepads and they have the dots in them, you know? And it makes it really easy to sketch. And I think people who, who I work with would be, be were, they're driven mad at my sketches. So I think sketching is what, obviously where I would always start with. Um, but like usually it, it starts with a really silly idea, you know, that's completely over-engineered and really unpractical. Um, and then after a while, you know, you try and build it and you go, that's crazy. And you kind of go from there. So I kind of, I probably have an over-engineering over, over start and then I try and whittle it down to something, you know, like one of the, one of the things I've learned in work actually being a software engineer um, is that you know user experience is one of the most difficult things. You can always create a solution to a problem, but actually something that's simple to use is actually the hardest part. So you know, you'll build a functional piece of kit that solves a problem, but it's a nightmare to actually use. And then you go to a more aesthetic design of like, you know, it looks a little nicer, but it's still a pain to use. Um, and then you go to something that's a little bit easier again. So user experience is kind of comes into that element of the design. Um, and, you know, like this for the first version of the bed that I built was, was, was the same, same kind of thing. It was probably four years ago. I've been working on it for about six years, but for four, four years ago, um, I'm kind of finished the first version of the bed, but it was, you know, it, it wasn't, so there's counterweights in this, which make it, you know, you can lift it with a finger. Um, and that's, you know, a design feature that has come about over a long period of time. I was kind of fighting it for a while and then I kind of embraced it. But, you know, beforehand I was designing like with winches, you know, winches that could lift 500 kilos and all this kind of stuff. And it was really heavy engineering. And like, actually that was, 
a terrible idea because I came back after a few beers one night and woke up the entire house because the winch is so loud that I had to bring the bed back down to get into it. And it was just the whole house was woken up going, what is going on? You know, so, you know, after a while, you kind of learn these things. And, you know, I think with personal projects and things like this, I think it, it is just about the, the, the journey and the, the learning and, and, and driving other people mad with your projects, you know. And, and you do have complete faith in your your locking mechanism for your bed to go back into the yeah, okay fine um <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh so this is actually it's it's it kind of it's, it takes from theater design so like you know all the rigging for theaters and you, you know you, you know in, in some of these amazing shows you see entire sets just float into the air and disappear mm -hmm. you know it's the exact same kind of technology there's you know pulleys there's winches there's counterweights there is some dude pulling a a cord but you can automate that and you know so it, the technology is all there it's been around for a long time you know you can get um uh certificates for for rigging and for flying uh equipment um, mm -hmm. and so it's all around that kind of thing so i've been working in theater for a long time as well so i kind of have that background and you know there's 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 a lot you can do to make that safe and so when the bed is actually up um it actually clicks into place in such a way that even if the counterweights went or if the cables went it wouldn't go anywhere. Um, and it actually uses um, technology that's in car doors. So another way you can unlock a car door with, you know, with, with the button in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the dashboard. That same technology is used here where you can press a button and actually then that will release the bed and the bed can come down. So there's, you know, there's lots you can do to actually make things like this um, practical in a, in a home environment. And I suppose that's probably the next phase of this project is actually to see how practical it could be to get it into other people's homes. That's great. I just, just want you to be safe, James. Yeah. <laughs> so good. Thanks for your answer on, on, on the other question. I think uh, that's Jeffrey's next question. Yeah, I was worried about uh, your laptop getting very hot. I see my laptop there now is pumping away its little fan. I guess it's different with a nice uh, Apple product there. But uh, would you be worried about the wood getting too warm or being too tight against the side and blocking the fan? Yeah, I mean, it depends on the, on the, on the laptop design. Uh, where's mine gone? I don't know. Uh, sorry, sorry. Um, so the, the, you kind of have to, you do have to be careful, all right. But the, the design for these, the, the fan is actually on the inside of the screen there. Um, and so you just got to make sure that the air circulation from the back to the front is okay in the middle of the screen. And I wouldn't be plugging in Apple products, but like, aluminium products or, 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 or metal products are, are, are kind of what I would plug because they're a little bit more hard wearing, but the, the metal actually doesn't insulate. It, it, it lets the, uh, the, the heat out as well, which is always, you know, for, for the likes of um, Apple Airs and, and iPads, they don't have fans. They just rely on the, the, the metal cover actually getting rid of a lot of that heat passively. Um, so yeah, you, you know, you, you gotta be careful. And actually there's one thing I did notice when when I've been working on large projects, when the and the, and the computer's going ninety, um, the the inside the air inside the box actually just starts to warm up a bit. So sometimes I have to take the take the laptop off the box. But actually, I've always been planning to put a, a, a hand hold, hand a kind of a hand gra grabber on a hole in the box that you know you'd be able to lift it a little bit easier. And something like that would also work for for the heat just being able to uh, be emitted from the from the box as well. Okay. Uh, I think David, I think that you had another question there. Um, I had a question about glue, was it? Is that my yeah, question? Yeah, the strength of wood glue. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think it was probably too important for, for this one, but uh, you were uh, putting on your, I don't know, your slats with the mitered edges and you just wood glued them down. I was just wondering, people get not weird about it but but whether glue is enough would you put a screw in as well and i guess maybe a question on you kind of said you just put it aside would you usually clamp the glue when you're doing that as well like when it's drying or are you happy for gravity to do the job yeah i mean it, it does it does depend um with with a, an element like this where the the, the weight isn't going to be huge you know the, the the pad of glue that sits between will be will be will be fine and um, there's like an element, I mean, we talked about aesthetics earlier on, there's an element of aesthetics where you wouldn't really want to be screwing things because you'd have to do it through the front because in order to grab into any sort in anything, the screw needs to grab into something. It wouldn't be able to grab into three mil. So it mm -hmm. needs to go through the three mil into there, which means the head is on the outside of the box. So, you know, there's always a toss up between, between these things, but generally speaking, when you put glue on 
you know, for faces like that, which are very uh, flat, you can basically apply your glue and actually just rub it down so that it is flat. Um, and when you press that against it, then you don't have any gaps where there's, um, where there's no glue or anything like that. So you can actually just totally cover the surface and press that down. So you just kind of, you gotta be, have to be careful that there's no air bubbles for that form. So when you do it, you kind of press from one side and you kind of, yeah. All right. actually, I'll, I'll get a piece and I'll show you. So when you're doing it, you can actually, you can totally fill this surface with glue. And then when you actually have that piece, then so you can put it up against it here and then like lean it that way. And that just pushes the air out from, from the bottom. And then when you're pressing it then you can kind of do the same thing. You're, you're starting from here and then you're moving over to this edge. You know, you're trying to just push as much air out as possible. And, in, and it, as I said, like the wood glue, like the one I have here, which is just the stuff that you pick up from your hardware, like, you know, it, if you get a good fixing and there's no dust in there, and, and like I said, you, you would probably rub it down with rubbing alcohol so there's no dust again and let it dry off. But that is, that is as good a finish as you'll ever get because plywood is essentially made up of the same stuff, you know? So you're essentially making more plywood, making more plies with glue. You know, you don't put screws through plywood. It's all made with glue anyway. So you're essentially just extending that to make your design a bit more like that. And I like the idea that then you have ply here and you've got your ply at the edge of this as well. So it kind of all works together. Hope that answers your question. It does. It does. Uh, thanks, James. Yeah, good, good tip on the rolling it out without bubbles. Um, I think probably one final thing. I think, um, uh, again, it was like, Based on the cooling the laptop, I think uh, I think Tomas was saying uh, maybe adding electronics to it. But one of them was like adding charger facilities, um, lead tidies, and things like that would be fun. I wonder would it be too heavy? Um, like would st stability be an issue? Like would it be top heavy? Yeah. So you are making a big chunk of wood, in fairness. So like this, this probably weighs twice as much as the the laptop itself. You know. So. That's where, that's where you kind of rely on, on the sturdiness of the box to hold it up. And, um, you know, the, like when I first built that, this into Dutch Labs, they have big desks that are kind of facing each other. So you, you wouldn't be worried about somebody walking by the desk and catching the, the, the box. So you do have to be careful about where you would place this. It's the same in a bedroom. Like if we're all working from home, you, you know, you're not running around with a lot of people in, in, in the same space. So you would have to be careful because you are, raising your laptop, which is your most expensive piece of kit up high. And, you know, that's kind of, that's where you would be. You have to be careful, but because the, 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 the laptop actually sits inside the walls of the box, the, the, the center of gravity stays within that. So you're not actually doing anything with cool legs or anything kind of that, that, that brings it, the center of gravity kind of narrower. That center of gravity is always going to be larger than the laptop, which means that when you set it down, um, it's not going to be rocking or moving or anything like that. You just need to make sure that that's, that's always the way. And I think that's the one, the, the one thing about, you know, if you're propping up your laptop on cardboard boxes or on books, books can be slippy and, you know, they all move independently of each other and things like that. So you'd almost be better going with something like this. And then, yeah, like, like Thomas was saying there, if you wanted to jazz it up a bit, absolutely. Like, you know, there's lots of projects we've seen over the last while where you can, you know, you can use the same kind of, Technology, Arduino, and all the rest to to totally jazz that up, you know. I think uh, I think that's all the questions uh, from the Q and A. But uh, yeah, it's coming up to yeah, it's like uh, to wrapping up time anyway. Um, so really, thank you for your time and doing the workshop live. Um, because uh, I think Thomas mentioned along the way in the chat that uh, you know how how are you keeping so calm and collectors, you know well. <laughs> <laughs> I think he was. I think you mentioned that, like putting an IKEA something in IKEA together, you'd be like cursing by the time yeah. it got to a point when you start screwing things together. So uh, well done yeah. on a, a live workshop. Um, yeah. But yeah, thank you again um, for doing this and being um, and taking part in Maker a Day. Uh, do you have any kind of shout outs you, uh, you want to do before we um, uh, before we wrap this session up? Yeah. Well, I mean. Um... So we're in the we're in the city um, in Dublin Eight, uh, right beside uh, Pastures Cathedral, and like there's one guy I want to call out, and and if anybody could support him, it would be great because he doesn't have any sort of Instagram, he doesn't have a credit card machine, but he runs a hardware 
on Camden Street and he's just fantastic. He's got every sort of piece in there. So I was in the in there this morning buying some more hinges. And you know, that guy is amazing. Um uh so <laughs> it completely offline plug for that hardware store. Um but generally speaking, yeah, like Tog, um Tog is fantastic. Like I I've done a lot of work on the bed in Tog. They've been very uh, forgiving of the size of the project for for when I had it set up in there and everything. So um so yeah big big thank you to Tog as well. Um and uh and yeah, so I mean, you can you can find um, my my channel is is just Instagram. I just pop up some some pictures of what I'm working on uh, sometimes, and I haven't even featured the bed yet because I don't really know what to do with it. But um, if it does become a, a, a kind of a public facing project, then you'll see it on the Instagram, and we'll plug it there, everything like that. Your handle is uh, made by Cliff on Instagram. So um, uh, like you're that. on Twitter as well. I've been tweeting you, but uh, I know you're on Instagram. Uh, so thanks again. Uh, but we do uh, for we're going to wrap up this session, but uh, we do have a special announcement right after this. Um, uh, it's going to be so I'm going to so I'll probably stay stay here for now. Um, so Jeffrey um, came up with an idea uh, to have a competition <laughs> and uh, I'm going to show you the details um, uh, in a minute and um, it's open to everyone. So but first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Dave. David who joined us um, and Jeffrey as well <laughs> and um, and yeah and thanks um, and James for the thing so um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, switch to myself where I'm going to show you um, the announcements of the competition um, so here we are it's a Christmas decoration uh, competition um, so let's celebrate making this Christmas um, so between we're partnering um, up with uh, uh, bench space down in Cork and Tog Hacker Space, and um, it's a chance for you to make um, kind of a small kind of Christmas decoration. Uh, you there's a um, first prize of a hundred euro one for all voucher, and then there's two runner up prizes of fifty one for all vouchers. Closing date is Sunday, December thirteenth of uh, this year, twenty twenty, um, at midnight Irish time. Uh, so we do have so the website um, um, to enter is uh, you can find it at dublinmaker.ie slash christmas dash decoration dash competition uh, there's some uh, kind of rules uh, so you must you, you have you have to be living in um, Republic Ar the island of Ireland so Republic Ireland and Northern Ireland 60% of your decoration must be homemade um, the decoration can be placed on a tree um, or in a window and for the younger folks who wanted to participate, um, uh, if you're under 18, please ask, uh, you can make the decoration, but please ask an adult who is over 18 to submit. So your parent or your guardian to submit your uh, entry and do take lots of pictures, share it out, um, social media um, and. Um, oh, yes, and our judges, we do have judges. <laughs> How are you going to win? <laughs> So uh, the judges will be, uh, I'm one of the judges uh, representing Double Maker. Um, we have Meg Without a Stitch, who will be kind of representing TOG. Uh, she's a member of TOG Hackerspace. And then we have Davis Connell uh, from um, Bench Spaces Cork. So um, again, um, the competition ends Sunday, December 13th of, um, this, um, at midnight uh, Irish time. And um, yeah, so go to doublemaker.ie um, Christmas dash decoration dash competition uh, to enter. There's a form there, but do um, have fun making your Christmas decorations and um, post them out all ev everywhere and share them with us. And then um, good luck to everyone. And um, on and just to wrap up Maker a Day, um, this week has been amazing. Thanks to the whole team, Double Maker team. Thanks to all the makers who participated, who came along and submitted their ideas through open call. And um, to all our partners, it has been fantastic. It was great to see everyone again, seeing all so many different types of maker maker projects. Um, so and it has been. Um, I have a huge learning curve. Live streaming is kind of quite quite kind of sort of uh, a learning curve for me as well. So we're learning behind the scenes and in front. So um, let us know what you think of everything, and don't forget, um, we we uh, we also did some uh, podcasts over summer, so it's still up. So have a check out. Uh, doublemaker.buzzbrad.com as well and if anything just uh, we're on social media so we're doublemaker on twitter facebook instagram and um yeah and please uh um like and subscribe our youtube channel um hopefully we'll make more videos 
So I'd like to say uh, thank you all again. Uh, until next time, and this is Vicky signing off. Stay safe, everyone.